Okay. Uh, for those of you just joining us, uh, my name again is Bob Fiddler, and I uh, work for Netch Instruments here in North America. Our headquarters in North America is in Burlington, Massachusetts. That's just north of downtown Boston. So if you're familiar with the Boston area, we're just about straight north, maybe 15, 20 minutes from uh, Logan Airport. Uh, my position with the company is technical sales and marketing. And I've been with the company now, gosh, it's been uh, 19 years. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's been a fantastic company to work for. I guess what I love best about Netch is it's a constant stream of new technology, new instruments, lots of things to keep uh, uh, to keep uh, to keep us stimulated and, and happy. So uh, it's been been really a great experience. Uh, I'm based here in Charlotte, North Carolina, so you can tell by the pictures above my smiling face there. Uh, we're in full bloom here in springtime. Charlotte's a nice place. Weather's, I think I said earlier, it's about uh, well, probably around 65 degrees and sunny. So it's uh, just perfect springtime day and uh, the flowers are blooming. You can see uh, those azaleas that you see in the top. That's actually in my front yard. Uh, I always like to show that. That's uh, it's, It makes you feel good to see all that color. And on the right hand side, that looks like cherry blossoms that are blooming. Uh, and you can see the skyline for downtown Charlotte. And uh, my background, I have got a, a BS in chemistry from the University of Pittsburgh. I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. And then uh, I moved to, to North Carolina about 28 years ago. Uh, I got my uh, master's in business from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And uh, I've got about 30 years experience now. It's uh, time flies, right? <laughs> 30 years experience uh, with marketing and technical sales in the analytical instruments industry. And more specifically now, about 24 years experience with thermal analysis instrumentation. So hopefully I will be able to put things in kind of a, relatively simple perspective because I'm kind of a simple guy anyway. So I'll uh, try to keep this uh, very user friendly and give you a lot of uh, good information to take home and uh, uh, keep it on a basis where uh, everybody can feel comfortable. Uh, okay. There's a chat function. You've got a blowout uh, or pop out box on the right hand side. You should have it on your screen. I'm going to test mine here just to see that it works and it looks good. Uh, you can send me messages through the chat, and then there's also uh, should be a little button that says questions, and you should be able to send questions there. I'll try to look at those while we're continuing, uh, but I can promise you at the end of the webinar today, we'll have a Q&A session, and we can go over your questions then uh, in more detail. But if you have something during the presentation, I'll try to, to take a quick peek at that box now and then and, uh, and see if there's anything that's going on live. Okay. And so it looks like to me uh, we're underway, that we've got good uh, view of everybody can see my slides. And so we'll just continue from here. Netch is a globally acting company, and it's a, it's a, a family-held group, uh, wholly owned by the Netch family in Selb, Bavaria. Selb is a city that's in the northeastern corner of Bavaria, and Selb is kind of in between Munich and Prague. If you know where Prague is in the Czech Republic and where Munich is, we're kind of northeast of Munich and due west of Prague. Okay. Uh, uh, I think what's important to mention here is, like I said, it's a, it's a globally acting company. There's three business units. Uh, the company was founded by two brothers, Natch, about 150 years ago. And these two engineers, these two brothers started to build pump fire wagons, uh, in this town, uh, to, uh, these bellows type fire wagons that were drawn by a horse and carriage to put out fires. And so even to this day, now 150 years later, pumps and systems is a big part of our corporation's business. It's not the kind of pumps that you remember from those old time movies, but uh, more often now it's uh, what we call Nemo eccentric pumps. And these eccentric pumps are designed to, to pump more viscous materials, things like oil, uh, food products, slurries, wastewater, even things like toothpaste. So anything that's difficult to pump, there's a really good chance that a Netch eccentric pump is uh, being used to convey the material. Uh, the second division of the company is called grinding and dispersing. People sometimes ask me where grinding and dispersing fits in with the company. But if you think of these two gentlemen, uh, Thomas and Christian Netch, 150 years ago, uh, being engineers, uh, the area where they were based in Selb is right in the heart of the German 
fine porcelain, fine ceramics industry. It's, it's been famous for hundreds and hundreds of years for very high quality porcelain. Uh, in that area, uh, it, it's famous for very high purity kaolin mines. And that kaolin, that white clay, is used for the best porcelain. So naturally, the company would start to build uh, to support that growing industry back 150 years ago, which would start to build ceramics production machinery. And as part of that is grinding equipment, because you've got to, to grind that material into very fine particles in order to properly mix it. So that's how we got into uh, grinding. And then about 50 years ago, uh, the folks in that fine porcelain and fine ceramics market came to the Netch engineers and said, you know, these are very expensive materials and products that we use, uh, this, this uh, 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 high quality kaolin and, and, and porcelain products, ceramics. We need some ways to test the material. So the Netch engineers started to build some of the very first thermal analysis instrumentation in the 1950s. And uh, we started to build some of the first TGA instruments, the thermogravimetric analyzers, to look at mass change. Why that's important to ceramics and porcelain is uh, you've got binders that you mix into those materials bef uh, as you put it in through the firing process, and those binders hold the particles together. So those binders uh, burn off during the firing process, and you have a weight loss. So they, they needed to know the quantity of those binders and also what temperature those binders came off at. So naturally, you can see how TGA would be beneficial. We also started to build some of the very first DTA instruments to look at things like phase changes of the raw materials used in ceramics and porcelain. And then that transitioned into DSE uh, as DSE evolved as a more sensitive technique for heat flows. And then we also built some of the first thermal expansion equipment during the firing process. It's important to know in a ceramic or porcelain how the material expands uh, or contracts in the case of sintering, how it contracts during, heatering, uh, during heating. So that's how we got involved in thermal expansion. Okay, so now you kind of get a get a feeling for uh, uh, the, the three different divisions of the company and how we uh, kind of got into thermal analysis based on just our geographic uh, proximity, just kind of fate uh, has it that the net engineers were right in the heart of that industry that needed thermal analysis. Uh, I think some other important notes on this slide. Uh, the company's about five hundred million dollars now. So it's a it's a, as I said, family owned and uh, uh, a good, stable, mid-sized company, and still growing very fast. Uh, we've got about 3,000-plus employees worldwide. Only a third of them are based in Germany. So what's really important about that is two-thirds of the company is based outside of the, uh, uh, the homeland and spread throughout uh, the world. So that's pretty exciting. Here, if you're in the United States, uh, we've got about 50 people that are based uh, here for thermal analysis. And I'm, I'm part of that 50 people. So it's been a great growth story. Our business unit for analysis and testing has, offers products that range from, uh, from minus 260 degrees C, that's liquid helium temperatures, to as high as 2,800 degrees. So uh, we are often known because of where the company got started in ceramics and porcelain. Uh, people seem to know us first as, I'll say, high temperature guys. Uh, but you can also see we're probably not just the highest temperature guys, but maybe even the lowest temperature guys as well. Uh, we've got dilatometers for thermal expansion that use liquid helium uh, to go down to minus 260 C. Or on the high temperature side, uh, we can achieve 2,800 degrees uh, with some of our instruments for uh, thermal expansion and then also for thermal conductivity. For TGA work, thermogravimetric analysis, we go as high as 2,400 degrees C and also cryogenic. Uh, we've got our TGA equipment that will go down as low as uh, minus 150 degrees C. So again, lowest temperature guys and highest temperature guys. So something to, to remember. Uh, thermal analysis, uh, we make instruments that look at things like changes in dimension. So that would be uh, thermal expansion, changes in mass. That'll be our TGAs. Phase transitions, that would be DTA, DS, and DSE. And enthalpies is a function of temperature. Normally, the enthalpies are measured by DSE, or differential scanning calorimetry. Netch is also quite famous for instruments for thermophysical properties testing, or thermal properties. And that's uh, sectors like thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity. We do that by the laser flash technique, also guarded hot plate, heat flow meters. Uh, we're also, uh, I think, prominent in the area of measurement of very high accuracy specific heat of materials. 
Uh, we can do that by DSC or also by the laser flash method and thermal expansion with our dilatometers and, and thermomechanical analyzers. A uh, third group of products in my division is calorimetry, uh, but this is more large scale calorimetry or adiabatic calorimeters that are used for thermal safety studies. We started this about five years ago and got involved in looking at uh, reaction processes, for example, for chemical storage uh, for long periods of time or at a certain temperature where customers need to know at what point the material may begin to react or possibly even explode. So you've all seen episodes where uh, uh, plants, like a, there was a fertilizer plant I know not too long ago in Texas that exploded. Uh, they probably could have benefited from one of these safety calorimeters to look at some of that material and see just how long it could be stored and at what temperature before it begins to have a runaway reaction. Another big area of application for these calorimeters is battery safety. So there's a very good chance that uh, if you have a smartphone or your laptop nearby and you can feel the heat that comes off, a little bit of heat coming off from the battery, there's a very good chance that Netch's instruments are now being used to test that lithium ion battery uh, for charge and discharge capacity, also uh, thermal runaway behavior. So that's really cool. That's a new uh, sector for us and it's really growing quite fast. And then finally, contract testing. Uh, we do contract testing measurements for a lot of customers before they uh, begin to use instrumentation. They might come to us for testing on a fee basis. And so we do contract testing uh, both here in the United States, up near Boston, uh, also in Shanghai, China, and then at our headquarters uh, worldwide in Cell, Germany. So some of you may have gotten exposed to us first through contract testing before you uh, uh, start to get your own instrumentation. So today's webinar on TGA, uh, we're going to look at first the method and instrumentation. Next, important properties of a thermal balance. Third, influencing factors on measurement results. And then finally, some application examples. And then last, we'll get into uh, question and answer. So we'll try to, uh, to cover your questions as well before we conclude. So as you go, th go forward, maybe make some notes, think about what questions you might want to ask, and I'll be glad to help. Okay, before we get further underway, and this is a good way for me to test if these uh, functions are working, are you using TGA now, thermogravimetric analysis, in your daily work? If you can use the chat function for that pop-out box, that would be great. That lets me know that uh, we're active. and. Uh, I guess another note is uh, some of you might use the term thermogravimetry. Thermogravimetry is also the technique, uh, and that's known by the acronym uh, TG. Okay, and that's really the same. So whether you call it TGA or TG, thermogravimetric analysis or thermogravimetry, we're talking about the same thing. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to uh, make a note there, and we'll check the uh, chat window and see if that's active. Oh, boy. Wow, we've got lots of folks here. That's great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your comments. And uh, for those of you that are currently using thermal analysis, hopefully I'll have some good tips and hints. And if you're not using this technique yet, hopefully I'll give you some good reasons why it would be useful for you to consider expanding your laboratory capabilities in the area of TGA. Super. Thanks, everybody, for responding. Okay. Here we go. What does the term thermogravimetric analysis mean? All right, first of all, it's a standardized testing technique and runs according to worldwide established norms. Some of you may know ASTM, the American Society of Testing Methods, testing, yeah, testing methods. Uh, so, uh, and also DIN, the German standards uh, and, and other worldwide standards as well. Uh, TGA is a technique in which the mass of a substance, or you could say of a sample, is measured as a function of temperature or time while the material, while your sample, is subjected to a temperature-controlled program in a specified atmosphere. All right, that sounds like a mouthful, but it's pretty simple. Basically, we're going to either heat your sample up in a, in a controlled atmosphere in a furnace uh, with, with special control of the gases, uh, that we input into the uh, into the furnace, or we can hold hold isothermally at a temperature and see how the material behaves. So you would take it to a certain temperature and then hold it. And what we're going to look at then is whether it gains mass 
or loses mass. I say gains mass because sometimes, and you'll see some examples here later on, TGA uh, can in fact look at mass gain. Most people think of it as just looking at mass loss, but, but there are definitely some unique examples where we're going to look at mass gain. Okay, so I'll try to show you both. Uh, the corresponding instrument is often referred to as a thermo balance. The balance is the basically this, the, the very sensitive scale that your sample uh, rests on while it's in the furnace, and then the thermo balance records the mass change. Okay, this is just a uh, kind of a quick uh, convention of what most of my slides are going to look like today for thermal analysis, uh, or TGA. Uh, this is an example of polyethylene, and you see here in this, uh, the heavy line is, is our trace of mass loss. So you've got TG or the TGA in uh, percentage, and then, uh, and then the other uh, curve here, the other line, is the differential, the derivative, okay, the first derivative. So here's our, uh, our change in mass. As we heat this material, you see the temperature axis down here on the bottom. We start to heat it up. We're measuring the sample with a thermal balance in the furnace, and you see there's not much changing with this polyethylene. And then finally, we start to get a break from the baseline as the material starts to decompose. And uh, so we have a weight loss. So this is your weight loss step. It always looks kind of like a stair step. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell where that kind of maximum point is in the stair step. So we really like to look at the first derivative. And the first derivative makes it a little more convenient for us to look then at where that midpoint is. See this 477.1? That's the midpoint or maximum change in the slope of the mass loss. And up here, uh, we often record also the onset temperature. That's basically where it started to break from the baseline, where it went from a stable mass to uh, beginning to, to lose mass. That's our onset of mass loss or onset of decomposition, whatever the case may be, onset of oxidation, uh, whichever you're looking at. Okay, so that's the convention we're going to see today. Usually the solid line is our mass loss. The dashed line is going to be the first derivative. Okay, so hopefully you kind of can see where that's useful. There are various types of balance systems that are used. And uh, going back, golly, thousands of years now, I suppose, these uh, hang down wire systems uh, uh, have been used. Uh, we don't see them too much nowadays, maybe in an, uh, an antique uh, uh, in your on your shelf. I think, I, and I know I have some customers who have these old, uh, old, uh, dual pan balances uh, that they've kept and, and they're, they're fun to look at. Uh, but usually we don't see that so much with TGA. There are some hang down wire systems that are used and in principle they kind of operate this way. But you'll see uh, the more modern technique is the top loading balance. So, so everything that Netch makes in terms of TGA instrumentation is designed from a top loading standpoint. Starting since the 1970s, everything that we manufacture is a top loading balance system. And I'm going to explain some advantages of, of top loading as we uh, go forward today. Also, some of you might have TGA equipment that's a horizontal beam balance uh, that, where they, the balance sits to the side and then you've got an arm or maybe two arms that, that, that come out from that and the mechanism is here on this side. I guess I prefer the top loading type systems uh, to these those uh, horizontal beam balances, particularly because of the, the, the fragile uh, fragility of those. If you've ever had some of those and broken the uh, balance arms, that's a real headache. So you'll see uh, top loading is 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 going to be a lot easier. So those are that's kind of a good take home point to remember. Uh, also, uh, you'll see about uh, we'll talk a little bit about the gas flow path here in a moment as well, and why the the top loading setup is is uh, quite beneficial. So again, everything we deal with, I'm going to talk a lot today about top loading design. All right, so. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind, why that's very important and why that's uh, uh, easy to use and quite beneficial for your work. So the top loading balance uh, that we employ, you've got basically a cantilever with an electronic compensation here that counterbalances then the sample as it sits in a furnace. So all this is set up in, in a vertical arrangement, and then we heat the sample and look at the change in mass. Uh, so it's pretty simple, simple in terms of the concept. You've got your balance the furnace, uh, a device for generating the desired atmosphere around the sample. So that would be things like uh, uh, flow meters or mass flow controllers. Then you've got your unit for data recording and processing. That'd be your computer. Okay. This top loading design is really nice. Uh, it's especially well suited for things like evolved gas analysis because gases by nature 
want to flow upward. Okay, they want to go up. And so the way the, the Netsch instrumentation is designed, the balance sits down below. Uh, the purge gas comes in here at the neck, and the gases evolve from the sample, follow the purge gas up and out. So it's really great because we don't have issues with then contamination. If you've got kind of a, uh, an older style hang down wire type TGA, your balance sits on top normally. And some of you may have had issues with uh, uh, contaminants kind of making their way up. Even though you try to run a horizontal purge gas, uh, those systems usually have a horizontal purge. The, the off gases tend to want to sneak up and get into that balance and kind of cause havoc uh, with your mechanism. So, yeah, that's, that's another reason why we, we really don't uh, advocate that hang down wire type system because it's just so hard to fight the natural flow of the gas. So with our top loading system, we basically support that, let it go right up and out. Uh, it's also, it allows us for easy access to the sample. You'll see as we go forward, the next sample sits right on the top of the of the furnace chamber. You just basically quickly set your, your sample right on this little pad, and then it lowers down into the mechanism into the furnace. So there's nowhere for the crucible to drop, nowhere for it to fall off. Uh, it's, it's very, very easy for uh, uh, the user. And then also we can change these sample carriers to do different experiments. We've got special carriers, uh, especially if we talk about our uh, simultaneous thermal analyzers. I'll show you that in a moment. So those sensors can be quick changed in a matter of seconds. And uh, so that's another reason why we like this top loading type setup. And again, just remember, it's uh, the idea here down at the bottom, low risk of contamination for the balance. You want to get those gases up and out uh, the top of the, uh, the furnace and away from your mechanism. So that's exactly why we went with this top loading type setup. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. There are different types of thermal balances from Netsch. I'll just give you kind of an introduction before we get into more into the technical details. We've got standard TGA instrumentation. Uh, this is the TG209F3 Tarsus. It's room temperature up to 1,000 degrees C. It's got a resolution of uh, uh, 0 0.1 micrograms. Uh, it's kind of a standard bread and butter workhorse TGA. Again, what makes it unique and different, maybe from if you're already doing TGAs, that it's our our famous top loading type design. The balance sits down below, the sample just sits right on top, lowers right down into the furnace. So super easy to use, and the gases uh, basically come out the top. So it's or out, basically out here out the top. So it's very easy to work with. Then you look uh, at the next model up, that's the TG209F1 Libra, also with a top loading type design. Uh, uh, the temperature range here is a little bit broader. It's a water-cooled furnace. It uses a recirculating chiller, and that recirculating chiller allows us to start at much lower temperatures, down below room temperature. So if you're dealing, for example, with a pharmaceutical uh, that wants to uh, uh, volatilize, uh, evolve some gases just sitting at room temperature, we can start this unit down as low as uh, about 10 degrees C. And then on the high side, we can go up to 1,100 degrees C. And because it's water cooled, it's very fast uh, for cool down as well. Uh, probably about 15 minutes to go from maximum temperature down to start. So that's quite nice. This model here is uh, one of our newer STAs. It's called the STA Regulus. And that's a, a, a TGA DTA instrument. Uh, the, the micro balance sits down below. This is your furnace on top. And then it's got a sensor that has a sample and reference. And we measure the heat flow. Uh, between the sample and reference, the delta T between sample and reference, change in temperature, and that tells us things like phase changes, temperature transition points. Okay, it's not really not really used to integrate the area under the curve. It doesn't really tell you the energy in joules per gram, but it definitely can tell you the temperature transition points really perfectly at the same time as mass changes. Okay, so that's DTA, TGA. And then we have uh, probably our flagship instruments called the STAs, the Jupiter series, F1, F3, and F5. Uh, you can put up to two furnaces on top. In this case, it's a furnace plus an auto sampler. Your micro balance is down below, your thermal balance. And then we've got a variety of different sensors that are quick disconnected down into that thermal balance. And so we can do uh, high temperature DSE. We can, uh, we can uh, work with 100% steam atmospheres, for example. We've got furnaces that will go as high as 2,400 degrees C. And all those furnaces and sensors are quick change. So that's really a, a tremendous horsepower, tremendous capability. I'm going to make another note here while I'm thinking about it. 
virtually all the instruments that Netch makes for TGA are vacuum tight. And uh, vacuum tight means it's not just gas tight. It means the chamber can be perfectly sealed down with a vacuum pump. And then you can backfill with very pure gas atmospheres. As, we're, as we go on today, you'll see why it's very important in TGA to control the atmosphere. You don't want gases coming in from outside the TGA and reacting with your sample, whether it's, it's issues of sample reaction or if you're using an evolved gas analyzer to look at the composition. You really want the internal atmosphere to be as clean and pure as humanly possible, and that's achieved through a vacuum-tight design. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I really want to reinforce that point. Uh, uh, net systems are top-loading, and they are vacuum-tight, okay? There'll be a quiz later. <laughs> uh, just kidding. But anyway, that's a, those are important points. So now let's talk about influencing factors on TGA measurements. Uh, concerning instrument properties, for example, uh, the things that you want to uh, know about in your TGA are the sensitivity of the balance, noise that might be associated with it, electronic noise, drift, and repeatability of measurements. Drift, uh, probably you've all had uh, seen your analytical balance as it sits during the day on your lab bench. Uh, when you come back to it to make a measurement, you'll notice the mass has kind of changed the instrument. You, you're, 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 you, you'll notice your balance has drifted, right? So that's kind of a normal behavior as time goes on and temperature in the laboratory changes. Uh, to, one, of the, one of the secrets to minimizing drift uh, with the Netch instruments is we use this recirculating chiller, and that stabilizes the electronics uh, throughout the day. So if you've got temperature changes in the room while you're making a very sensitive TGA measurement, you want to make sure that your, your system is as drift-free as possible. And that's, again, that's done through these, uh, uh, both through the, the uh, mechanical design, but then also through the electronic, uh, through the uh, uh, recirculating chiller. Uh, there's a note here about uh, buoyancy effect. Some people ask, what's buoyancy effect? All right, buoyancy effect is an apparent weight increase during heating. So you'll, you'll generally see this in, your, in a first run in a TGA, an apparent weight increase. So why do you get that? Well, the density of the gas atmosphere around the sample inside the furnace, inside the sample chamber, goes down during heating. So it gives you this apparent weight gain of the material. Now, it's in, it's in every TGA. Uh, so no matter, no matter how it's designed, buoyancy is just a, a, a reality in TGA. So the extent of which uh, the buoyancy effect uh, is depends on the design of the TGA. So we do a lot uh, at Netch to minimize the buoyancy effect. But then it's very, very easy to correct as well just by running a blank run. You take your empty, empty crucible and run a blank run with your, over your temperature conditions and with your gas settings. And that is stored then digitally and then matched up against your sample curve and subtracted out. So that's the normal way to deal with the buoyancy effect, no matter what type of TGA that you have, uh, we recommend that. But we also have in some of our newer instrumentation software techniques that will uh, 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 accommodate then the buoyancy effect uh, digitally built into the software. So you don't, you don't have to always run a, a blank run anymore if you've got some of the newer design instruments, okay? Other uh, things to be concerned about uh, when you get into your TGA work, things to just kind of hold in the back of your mind, uh, the type of sample holder that you're using, the sample container, that's the, the type of crucible that you're using. Uh, is it compatible with your sample type, for example? Uh, the material it's made of, if it has a lid or not, some of the, uh, some of the lids uh, we have are perforated so that the gases can escape but you put them on top just so that you can have kind of a nice stable atmosphere over your sample uh, or in case your sample likes to wants to creep out uh, as it's heated, uh, the lid can kind of help keep that down as well. But these are perforated so the gases can escape. Other uh, things to think about in terms of the measurement are your heating rate. And we'll show some examples of that in a moment, how that affects your measurement atmosphere and also purge gas flow rate. Concerning sample properties. Things like the, the nature of your sample, the consistency of your sample, uh, nature being things like uh, whether it's liquid or solid. Uh, uh, consistency can be thought of as homogeneity, how well mixed the sample is. Sample mass is going to be very important. We'll show you an example of that shortly. Sample size. Um, we say size here. In this case, we're talking more about the, 
the shape of the material, the particle size, how well it's exposed uh, to the atmosphere inside the furnace chamber. And then also the heat transfer, thermal diffusivity, how fast, uh, how effectively your sample uh, heat can transfer through your sample. So these are things to think about. But we're going to focus right now on balanced performance, sensitivity, noise, drift, and re uh, repeatability. First of all, we want a stable TGA signal over time. Okay, so here's a good example of our system. Uh, this was the uh, one I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, the basic TGA instrument called the TG209F3. Uh, that's uh, kind of our bread and butter TGA up to 1,000 degrees C. And you can see even uh, with the basic system, we've got uh, here we're, we're holding isothermally for five hours at three different temperatures under nitrogen with the empty ceramic, empty alumina ceramic crucible. And you can see that it's essentially extremely stable. You're down in the, in the, in the uh, range of, of below 10 micrograms for the most part, uh, uh, two micrograms here, uh, and at the highest temperature uh, recorded here, 700 degrees, two micrograms. So it's really tremendous stability. It's important because if you've got small mass changes and your signal is not stable, then you may lose those mass changes uh, in, the, in the, uh, the noise of the signal. So you want a very stable thermal balance. So and no matter what TGA you're using, you need to see some kind of performance criteria like this. Okay? Small dynamic drift of the TGA signal during heating. Remember, I spoke in the beginning about drift and, and, and where that comes from. You know, usually it's electronic noise uh, that's generated, uh, particularly as you've got temperature changes in the room or temperature changes from the electronics of the instrument. So you've got to have a TGA that minimizes this dynamic drift during heating so that you don't, again, lose critical mass changes in your sample. So here's uh, a good example, then, of the drift specifications for the, the next model, the TGF1 Libra. And you see it's very similar to that F3. Uh, we did a test here up to 1,000 degrees C, uh, running a baseline at uh, 20 degrees per minute. And you see as it's being held uh, uh, dynamically or being run dynamically, our, the drift change is only about uh, 6 micrograms, so extremely stable. Uh, performance behavior in all of our equipment. And again, uh, drift, uh, uh, probably the real key there is the, the chilling system, uh, plus the mechanical design is, it really helps the Netch instruments to be extremely stable uh, for long periods of time. So people that, that need to measure fine mass changes over long periods of time, gosh, you, you got to have a balance that's, that's stabilized. Okay. It's, it, you'll see a huge difference. Oh, I'm going to make another note here. Uh, rates. Typically, heating rates are expressed in Kelvin per minute. So that's not a typo or some, some foreign nomenclature. But a lot of, a lot of us uh, might say uh, 20 degrees C per minute. That's, that's okay, too. But the, but the official convention is going to be 20 degrees Kelvin, uh, 20 Kelvin per minute. Okay, so if you see that K, that's not a typo. That's just kind of using the official nomenclature Kelvin. All right? And... We're going to look at good reproducibility. We talked about the different properties of the thermal balance. We want reproducibility to be the best it can be. So here we're looking at a calcium oxalate monohydrate standard sample that we run in TGAs to really to, to get a good comparison how the instrument is behaving. It's, it's a really good standard to run. So we've got two samples, uh, both around a mass of uh, 10 milligrams. And you can see that here's your, that stair step we talked about in the beginning where the mass changes. That's the release of water in the calcium oxalate monohydrate. And then with the second step, as we get up to around 500 degrees, we get the release of CO. And then around uh, 600 plus degrees, we see the release of CO2. And then finally, we stabilize after it's, uh, after it's gone. So I think what's important about this slide is you can get a feel for the uh, really this, this uh, impeccable reproducibility in the measurements. So this is the F3 model, that, that basic workhorse model. And even with this model, it's just spot on in terms of running the uh, uh, calcium oxalate standard sample. So that's what you want to have. You want to have good reproducibility of the measurement curves, sample to sample, and know that uh, any changes are related to the actual sample, not maybe a finicky behavior of the, the TGA, okay? So again, yeah, you see, there's actually two curves here uh, that perfectly fit.
All right, so we've talked about sensitivity, noise, drift, and re repeatability. Now we're going to look at atmosphere effects, heating rate, sample mass, and sample shape. Uh, sample, let's say sample size, but let's say sample geometry or sample shape, particle size. All right, so let's kind of keep those four things in the back of our mind as we go forward, things to really th consider, think about in terms of how they're going to affect your TGA measurements. Heating rate, atmosphere, sample mass, and sample size. Okay? All right, let's start first with atmosphere. Uh, this is a, a polymer. It's an SEBS in polypropylene. And SEBS is a styrene, ethylene, butylene, styrene elastomer, thermoplastic elastomer. It's uh, basically like a rubber. And uh, when we combine that with polypropylene, uh, this is pretty often used now in children's toys, uh, just for example, or toothbrushes, anything that kind of makes contact with the body. Uh, so often now in the polymers industry, uh, People want to avoid a lot of these additives. You've heard of things like phthalates, for example, in baby bottles and stuff like that. You know, we want to get rid of some of those plasticizers. Uh, a, a lot of children's toys, for example, uh, in the past have been made by made out of PVC, polyvinyl chloride. It's usually a brittle polymer, so we've got to input uh, plasticizers, things like phthalates in there to, uh, to make it uh, more flexible, more pliable. And uh, so th there's just been a big move in the industry to go towards additive free. And, and so that's just to explain what that polymer is. If it's, if it's new to you, uh, now you get a feel for what this is. So what we're going to look at is this SEBS polypropylene uh, compound, uh, both in air and under a nitrogen atmosphere. So in nitrogen, we're looking at thermal stability. Sometimes in the polymer, uh, the polymer sector will also say pyrolysis. So I guess you could probably use that term here as well, because we're basically looking at thermal stability in nitrogen. And we're going to compare that to how the, uh, the material behaves when we run it under air. Okay, so we look here. This is our first heating, 20 degrees a minute. We've got a 10 milligram sample, and there's uh, no, no mass being lost. And then uh, finally we get to around... 300, uh, 300 and some degrees, and you see it start to break from the baseline, and we're starting to lose mass. So there's our classic stair step in the TGA profile. Uh, this is the dotted line I told you about, the differential, or the, uh, the first derivative of the curve. So that tells us more easily then where that uh, um, maximum point uh, is in the slope. And then here's your onset. Remember, we said sometimes folks want to know what the onset is, where it starts to break, uh, from the baseline where it starts to lose mass. So that's your onset and that's your maximum point, okay, in a nitrogen atmosphere. Pretty neat. Uh, this is a comparison then in air, and you can see it it's behaves uh, quite a bit differently. Uh, first of all, in the, this is your blue, similar to that solid curve with the green. This is your mass loss curve, and you can, you can more clearly make out that there's kind of two two steps going on here. We saw something in the in the derivative for the nitrogen curve. Maybe you can even see it here. There's kind of a, a shoulder here. So there's, there's looks like a couple steps going on, but it's hard to make out uh, under nitrogen. But in air, we can definitely see, uh, especially if you look at the derivative, uh, this uh, totally different uh, uh, profile, okay, in, in an air atmosphere. And we definitely have uh, two two real steps going on here and maybe even maybe even something else here as well, okay? So you can see in an air atmosphere, you get uh, really completely different uh, characteristics. The onset of breakdown is, is different significantly, and also then the, uh, uh, the maximum points in the, uh, where it loses most of its mass have changed a lot by, by almost 100 degrees as well. Okay, so the big difference between running thermal stability measurements in nitrogen versus oxidative stability measurements in air. Okay, I think we covered this. Those are your, you can see your peak temperatures have shifted by about 100 degrees there in that maximum uh, mass loss. Okay, so we talked about uh, the gas atmosphere. Now we're going to look at heating rate. And you can see uh, here is an example. Again, this is that uh, Kelvin, 5 Kelvin uh, per minute versus 10 Kelvin per minute of that calcium oxalate monohydrate standard. If we're talking about some a, a material where there's no competitive reactions going on, as we change the heating rate, okay, it's, it's, it's just a compound, it's, there's no additional reactions, then the mass loss steps are going to re remain constant. The mass loss steps themselves, the mass that we lose, should remain constant. Uh, but what we see here 
is that the decomposition effect is shifted to higher temperatures with increasing heating rate. So just as a kind of a rule of thumb, as we shift to higher temperatures, uh, uh, as we increase the heating rate, the decomposition effects are going to be shifted to higher temperatures. Let's say all things being equal, right? If there's no other reactions going on that somehow we're accelerating uh, by going to a higher heating, uh, faster heating rate, okay? So in this case, there is no reaction that we're accelerating. So, so the mass loss steps are the same, but the temperatures have changed, okay? So heating rate can be very important. It is very important. And you can see then the onset, just if we look at that, that third break where we went to uh, evolution of CO2, uh, you can see it's uh, got a 40 degree shift as we went to a faster heating rate, okay? So we talked about gases. We talked about heating rate. And now let's talk about sample mass, all right? If we increase sample mass, a rule of thumb is that we get a shift in the decomposition step to higher temperatures with increasing sample mass. So similar to what we just saw uh, with the heating rate, you get a shift. Here's a mass uh, of 3 milligrams versus a factor of 10 more, 30 milligrams. Okay? So we're getting a shift again to higher temperatures with increasing sample mass. Uh, let's see. I wanted to make a point about heating rate. Also, let's go back to the heating rate for a second. I was just thinking about this. Uh, so people have asked me, why do I get a shift uh, in the uh, here to higher temperatures? And that's, uh, that's an important comment. Uh, this has to do with temperature distribution inside the sample. We're going to we'll talk about sample geometry in a minute as well. That's what got me thinking. Uh, but when you go to a higher heating rate, then you create a larger thermal gradient in the sample. Okay, and that means it takes longer for the sample to reach these reaction temperatures. That's why it's being shifted. So that's a, a point I wanted to make about that uh, uh, as well. All right. So again, the temperature distribution of the sample. So we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. And so those are, again, more important things for you to remember. And that's, uh, you're going to have that same kind of issue uh, with sample mass. Okay. The bigger the mass, usually the longer it's going to take for the uh, heat to transfer into the material, so you get a shift then in terms of those temperatures. So, so uh, gases, heating rate, sample mass, right? Those are three. Oh, we, this is kind of recaps that. You see how that shifted? Okay, it's pretty obvious. So, sample mass uh, behaves the same kind of the same manner as heating rate as we increase. And now we talk about sample says says size here, but let's call it sample geometry. Uh, uh, however, however way you want to define it, okay? But here you're looking at particles, uh, 10 micron particles uh, versus 1, 1.5 mic micron particles. And if you think about this, it's, it's, it's intuitively obvious, I suppose, that the, the, the finer the particle, the more exposed it is uh, to, the, to the atmosphere, and, the, and the, more, the, the, the freer it is to liberate the gases that want to come off. So as we say here, the temperature... Uh, at which the component migrates from the sample, so the gas that's evolved from the sample, whether it evaporates or s sublimates from the sample to the sur uh, sample surface to the surrounding atmosphere, depends on the dimension of the surface area. So the higher the surface area, usually you're going to see a better uh, evolution of the gas species. So, uh, so that's basically what we see here, right? We look at this uh, this 1.5 micron powder, and you can see uh, it begins to lose mass. Uh, at a faster, faster. Uh, well, I want to say earlier is the word I want to say earlier than uh, what we have with the larger particles. So those are the four parameters to think about next time you run your TGA measurements: uh, the gas, the uh, heating rate, the uh, sample mass, and sample size. Okay. So hopefully I've been able to show you that these definitely can have a, a pretty big impact. And this just recaps that you can see the shift now. It's about 40 degree shift. Okay. So we talked about the influencing factors, and now we're going to come up with some, some recommendations for you. Number one, keep the measurement conditions as similar as possible. If you're trying to compare two samples, you want to keep the measurement conditions as similar as possible for all test runs within a series of measurements. Okay? You want to be as consistent and constant uh, as possible. You want to have an identical heating rate, an identical gas atmosphere, an identical gas flow rate, identical, uh, ident identical crucible material and crucible type. 
the same kind of sample preparation, identical or similar sample size. So that's, we talked about particles. Uh, you know, if, if one of your samples is in a powder form and the other is in a big chunk, you're going to see a difference, right? So you want to have similar sample geometry. Uh, sample masses, if you're comparing two materials, you want to have as similar masses as uh, possible. Finally, uh, proper calibration of your instrument in terms of temperature and uh, mass or weight. Okay, here's a good chance to uh, kind of uh, reshift our thought processes. If you don't mind, if you could go into the chat window, I'm interested to know what kind of material that you're analyzing. TGA has such a broad uh, utility, so if you have a moment uh, and can, can uh, poke that pop-out window and make a note, uh, that'd be really nice to, to, to know. So we're, I'll take just a few seconds to see maybe what comes up. Oh, boy, okay. There's a lot of folks doing polymers work. Uh, we've got some metals, organics. Oh, composites, okay. Inorganics, excellent. Uh, pharmaceuticals, anybody here for pharmaceuticals? Going once, going twice. Yes, I see a pharmaceutical. Okay, excellent. I think we've got really good coverage of the next applications then uh, to give you something that's going to be relevant to your work. It looks like we've got a really diverse group. Okay, my, let's see if this catches up here. Here we go. All right, so the main areas of application for, remember we said at the beginning thermogravimetry or thermal analysis, just wanted to switch it up, make sure you're paying attention. Uh, so thermogravimetry is TG, thermogravimetric analysis, TGA, same thing. So we talked already about thermal stability or degradation in a nitrogen atmosphere. Uh, usually in the area of polymers, we, you often use, uh, hear the term pyrolysis studies uh, under nitrogen. I have trouble trying to, to differentiate those terms. I, I feel like uh, the concept's pretty similar, whether we're looking at, we call it degradation or decomposition or pyrolysis. Uh, you're generally looking at thermal stability under nitrogen. Then we've got oxidative stability or combustion. We showed an example of that earlier. Composition analysis. TGA is really, really useful for looking at the formulations of materials, the composition, based on the volatile components as they are evolved from the sample. So it can tell you what temperature they came off at, and it can tell you how much they were. So the temperature and the, con uh, well, the, the, the amount can be generated from the TGA. We'll talk a little bit more about that, ways to extend that from beyond just knowing temperature and amount. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about coupling to gas analyzers in a minute. Uh, purity investigations, things like residual solvents, excipient uh, analysis is, is in the pharmaceutical industry. That's uh, uh, basically the carrier versus the, the, the uh, active ingredient. So you might need to know solvent content, for example, excipient content. Also, we look at things like interaction with the environment. I have an example here in a minute. Uh, we look at uh, reaction with the gases. Okay, so interaction with the environment, the gases inside the sample chamber. Simulation of manufacturing processes. If you've got a sintering process or a firing process, a kiln process, uh, if you're baking, well, it could be even a food product or, or something like a brick or ceramic, uh, the TGA can help you look at the and really simulate the manufacturing process. Kinetic studies. That's the reaction rates. Uh, that kind of tells you how quickly or how slowly the mass is, uh, is, being, is changing. Okay, so that's your kinetics, your reaction rates in the decomposition behavior. So here's an example. Uh, we'll start first with thermal stability. This is a pharmaceutical. So for those of you folks that are interested in pharmaceuticals, I've got something for you. This is uh, ranitidine, and ranitidine is a, uh, it's an antihistamine that's used to block uh, stomach acid. Okay, so it's used to treat reflux and ulcers. Uh, probably a good brand name would be Zantac. Maybe maybe you guys know Zantac. So now you can you can tell all your friends that you've seen TGA of Zantac and what, what it looks like. Uh, it's pretty uh, pretty interesting. Uh, this is uh, you can see as we heat it up to about 250 degrees. Uh, we're in a nitrogen atmosphere, about a four milligram sample. There's no mass change, and until we get to about 160 degrees, then we start to to break from the baseline. The mass is lost, and we've got kind of a two step process. And that's verified more cleanly when we look at 
that first derivative. So you can see that maximum point in the uh, mass loss slope. And then uh, also, this is the, the kind of where we break for that onset. But here in the derivative, we can see the maximum point here uh, would be here around 165. And then the maximum point in that second step around 255 degrees C. Okay. So that tells us uh, uh, about thermal stability of this pharmaceutical material in, in our atmosphere. Composition analysis. I mentioned uh, on that previous slide that composition analysis is very important. Uh, and, and you can use the TGA to look at the different ingredients as they come off. So this is an example. If you look down here in the legend, this is polyethylene with carbon black. And I guess a good example where something like this might be used, if you've ever seen uh, these uh, uh, geothermal liners, uh, uh, hazardous waste liners in these uh, 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 pits or waste lagoons, uh, maybe you've seen them from the air as you fly in an airplane, and you'll see these waste lagoons near the airport. Uh, usually there's a, there's a really, really thick uh, geothermal liner that uh, uh, is uh, holding the material in. And uh, it's very important that it has the right formulation, that it doesn't uh, break down or oxidize uh, as it sits uh, uh, for, for, for years and years holding some of that waste. Okay. Uh, so here what you see in this, uh, with this polyethylene sample is we heat it up to 1,000 degrees. We're going to do the first part under nitrogen in case we're going to get a pyrolysis of the polyethylene. So you see the, the weight loss, just a big weight loss step as we break down the uh, polymer backbone. This is your derivative again. So you can see a really nice clean uh, step. The maximum points around 482 degrees. Uh, but in order to get the carbon black content, we do that by switching then at about 850 degrees, we switch to air or oxygen. And that lets us combust the carbon black. And uh, this is a really important comment here. I mentioned already about the importance of vacuum tight. Remember, I said we want to keep outside gases out. Okay. So if you had outside gases, air, mixing into your nitrogen purge, for example, that carbon black would probably get consumed somewhere here along the process and you wouldn't be able to characterize it. So using a vacuum tight instrument like Netch offers, uh, you can very, very cleanly separate something like carbon black from the polymer uh, backbone. Okay, so that's a very important uh, comment. Otherwise, if we, if we ran this all under the whole thing under air, it would probably look like one big blob. Or if we ran it under nitrogen and there was oxygen leaking in, again, it would kind of all sort of smear and you wouldn't really get this nice perfect mass loss step for the uh, carbon black. Okay, so please remember that. Vacuum tight. Okay, and that's uh, just kind of circles uh, what the point we just made. All right. Interaction with surrounding atmospheres. Remember, I had a, like a list. Uh, so some of the sometimes in TGA, we're going to be looking at mass gain. We, we can look at uh, absorption or adsorption onto a substrate. So here's a silica gel and uh, in a humid atmosphere. Our TGA instruments and our SDA instruments are designed so that we can work in humid atmospheres. We've got special capabilities for that and a humidity generator. So here's an, an experiment where we take a silica gel in a humid atmosphere at about 45% relative humidity at uh, 20 degrees C, and we look at the uptake of water by the silica gel. Okay, so what you're looking at here now, it's the reverse of everything we've already done uh, for the past uh, few minutes. It's a mass gain as we uptake humidity or uptake water onto the sample. And then we can do a desorption. Oops. Oop. Uh, hit the wrong button here. Ab absorption. Desorption. Okay, so as we start to heat up to a higher temperature, we can start to basically take that water back off that's been absorbed onto the material and then desorb it. Okay, so you see as we... Uh, heat up to the next stage. This is your this is your furnace temperature. You can see temperature on the right. And we heat up. It starts to evolve off. And we stabilize. We take it to the next temperature. We get some more off. We take it to the next temperature here in red. And we see some more come off. Almost ad infinitum, right? As we kind of go up, you can see this a little bit more lost each time. Okay? So absorption, desorption studies is, is common with TGA. 
Okay, here's a neat example. Uh, corrosion studies on steel. And I mentioned already again about mass gain. Corrosion is generally going to be a mass gain. You're, you're, you can kind of see in this photograph, it's a pair of rusty scissors. Uh, I don't know where they got those rusty scissors, but uh, must have been, been left outside for a few days. But uh, uh, anyway, if you take some of that metal, uh, what you see here, this is a platform. The Netch STAs can run really, really uh, big samples, big pieces of material. And that's, that's really great for looking at low levels of corrosion, very fine mass gains over time. Although this one has a pretty, pretty gross uh, mass gain, pretty large mass gain. So what you're looking at in red, uh, this is your temperature program. We heat the sample up, this chunk of steel, uh, in a water vapor atmosphere. Uh, and uh, we're at 1,100 degrees. And you can see as that, that steel begins to rust, begins to oxidize, okay, and corrode. And you're looking now at a mass gain, okay? That's got a lot of mass gain. Sometimes if you're looking at, you know, fine mass gains, corrosion on a, on a steel wire, something like that, it could be really, really low mass gains. And that's why we you need such high sensitivity and such low drift okay but i think this is kind of cool because you can run again run large chunks of material simulating the thermal behavior during a process and during processing so this is a building material uh building material powder and uh we're going to go through the firing process and uh let's see i'm gonna uh yeah we'll just go ahead and illuminate these now uh in a normal TGA, all you'd see is the mass loss steps and then that derivative. So like I mentioned earlier, you, you can see where the mass loss happens and you, uh, you know the amount of the mass loss, but you don't know what it is, right? The T unless you really understand the formulation of your material, and sometimes that's not easy, uh, uh, you can say, I had a mass loss here, I had a mass loss here, and I had a mass loss here. Uh, but connecting the TGA or the STA to an evolved gas analyzer, like an FTIR or a mass spectrometer or a GC mass spec, gives us the ability to tell us exactly what those components are. So that's important to know as well. If you have your TGA and you, you wish you had a way to, to, to identify what those components are, we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. But evolved gas analysis is really powerful uh, when coupled to... Uh, to your TGA. Okay, thermal stability identification. Uh, thermal stability, we can, we can look at the thermal stability in nitrogen of different polymers. Okay, so I'll kind of go through this a little bit faster. There's, uh, there's four polymers here, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, polypropylene, low density polyethylene, and PTFE. And that's great. We run them in nitrogen and we see they've got a, they've got a characteristic uh, degradation temperature. And you can very easily separate these. You could say, oh, if my degradation is here, it's probably PTFE. If my degradation is here, it's probably PMMA and so on. All right. That's nice. But what happens if uh, the materials, we can't tell the difference between the material, uh, the, 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 uh, that degradation point is too close. Netch has a very unique way to measure a signal called CDTA or calculated DTA in our basic TGA instruments. What we do is because it's a top loading design, remember I told you why top loading was important? This is another reason, right? We talked about top loading is important because you support the natural gas flow path. Uh, it's uh, 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 easy for sample use. It's easy to exchange sensors, but here's another really cool advantage. We can put a thermocouple directly underneath this sample pad, okay? And this is what then lowers down into the furnace automatically. All the operator sees on the top of the TGA is this little pad. You plop your crucible on here, press a button, it lowers down into the furnace. This thermocouple is measuring the sample temperature, and we're referencing it against the furnace wall, a, a thermocouple in the furnace wall. That's our program temperature. And as the material, as your sample in here in the crucible starts to undergo some kind of a transition, it may have a change then in that temperature effect, okay? So let's say, for example, it's melting, and that's what you're seeing here. In blue, this is the heating of the furnace. It's happily going up at a nice linear rate, okay? Uh, but in red, 
this is what's going on inside the sample. Let's say it's a, a melting point of a, we've got a metal in there or a polymer. It now stops following the furnace as the energy is being input to melt the sample. So we get a delta T, a change in temperature between the sample and that reference thermocouple in the furnace wall. Okay. So it's kind of like the basic signal in a DSC, uh, but we don't really have any, any real reference here or a basic DTA. So we call this a calculated DTA signal. It's perfect for measuring those temperature transition points. Okay. It can tell us these temperature transition points. Uh, I wouldn't really recommend it for integrating the area under the curve. I would say at that point, you would use one of our STAs that has a true DSC TGA sensor. But this calculated DTA is really useful. And again, it's made possible because of this top loading design. We can run our wire right underneath the sample. If you're using a hanged on wire sample, TGA, for example, there's nowhere to do it, right? Your sample's hanging from this little basket. Uh, you, can't, you can't run a wire there. So sorry, <laughs> CDTA is only uh, really possible when you can get that, uh, that wire directly underneath the sample pad. So that's a great reason for, a, for an edge TGA. Okay, and here's a good example of that. Uh, I showed you two slides ago, the different polymers and the degradation uh, and how they were nicely separated. Well, guess what? Here's nylon six and nylon six, six, and their degradation falls right pretty much on top of each other. It's hard to tell one from the other. Okay. But with that CDTA, the calculated DTA capability, we can tell very nicely uh, based on this melting temperature that we can, can uh, sense that one is nylon six, polyamide six, and one is nylon 66, polyamide 66. Okay, so that calculated DTA is really excellent as a, a technique, as a feature to add some horsepower to your basic TGA work. Okay, and here's something else you can do with the CDTA. You can very, very, very accurately calibrate your TGA furnace. If you've got an older TGA and you're used to having to do Curie points, right, these metal uh, magnetic metal standards, and you look at the transition, I think, from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic uh, at a certain temperature. It basically puts a little fluctuation on your balance, uh, your thermal balance, and that fluctuation tells you a specific temperature point. Uh, but guess what? That's usually probably plus minus 10 degrees or something like that. So it's it's just been sort of the necessary evil for uh, older style TGAs uh, to try to calibrate the furnace. But now using this CDTA calculated DT technique, we can very, very accurately use metal melting points to, cal uh, to calibrate then the furnace temperature. So another good reason for the CDTA, uh, we can use these standards then to get within a, a tenth of a degree or so inside the furnace compared to, I don't know, 10 or 20 degrees uh, in, your, in your old style TGA. Okay, so accurate calibration and also identification of things like melting points or uh, other transitions. Okay, that's CDTA. We'll talk uh, for about five minutes now about coupling. Uh, again, I mentioned before, all the instruments from Netch are vacuum tight, and that assists in coupling to gas analyzers. We make a whole range of coupled systems. A lot of people get first get experience with Netch in the area of coupling their thermal analyzers to a gas analyzer. So if we took any of our standard TGAs or the STA equipment, we can couple to the FTIR. Uh, normally, we, we advocate the Bruker systems because all the Bruker software is designed to mesh neatly with the Netch software and everything can be driven from one computer. Your TGA traces are superimposed with the FTIR data. So it's, it's, it's perfect synchronization uh, uh, of the results. So we can tell not just how much the gas is that comes off and when it comes off, but we also know exactly what the gas is. Right, so that's why coupling is important, and also this is why we, I guess, we really like to work with the Bruker system. It's all completely uh, synchronized and integrated. Okay, this is the gas cell, and you can even use this FTIR as a standalone unit too in this compartment. You just divert the beam to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, sample compartment, and you can run things like plaques and uh, your ATR cell and so forth. Okay, uh, here you can see down below we can take our STA. Uh, uh, and connect that to not just the FTIR, but also to the mass spec, a GC mass spec. Okay, so that's really unique. We can do both types of uh, composition uh, analyzers, gas analyzers at the same time through a Y coupling. 
Uh, this is uh, the STA or TGA connected to our flow-through mass spectrometer. Uh, and then here's uh, two of the, uh, the newest developments, or most unique developments anyway. Uh, the skimmer system takes the thermal balance. Here's your furnace, so it all kind of looks similar. The mass spectrometer sits right on top, so there's uh, no transfer line. The gases come straight from the furnace into the mass spectrometer, and that thing can be heated as high as 2,000 degrees C without condensation. That's awesome. The sensitivity achieved in the skimmer system, there's nothing like it in the world. Uh, we've done a similar concept now with an FTIR from Bruker called the Alpha. And that little Alpha, it's about, about as long as your forearm, uh, can sit right on top of the TGA furnace or on top of one of our SDAs, okay, like we have here. This, this little guy mates right on top. The gases come out of the furnace right into the FTIR. We call that the Perseus coupling. So that's really neat as well. It gives us, it gives us uh, a small footprint, high sensitivity, fast response. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment here. Uh, pyrolysis, here's an example of, of, of where it could be useful. Pyrolysis of biomass. More and more work going on in the market uh, to look at new sources of energy, biomass, straw, switchgrass, things like that. Okay, to burn those and see just uh, how, how, what kind of uh, energy we can generate. So here we're going to look at the, the uh, degradation of the straw. So our classical TGA, we get a series of mass loss steps looks fairly complicated. Quite a few things going on. This is our differential. Yep, got multiple steps here. Uh, that's nice. Okay, but what is it, right? If we connect that to the FTIR, we can get at the same time as we're getting our mass loss curve, we get the evolution of the gas species by the FTIR, okay? So here we see that with the pyrolysis of straw, a presentation of the mass loss curve the first derivative, and then three different FTIR traces that we're, we're tracking over time. So here's our mass loss uh, profile in blue. This is the differential. So we see these mass loss steps more clearly. But now we look at the FTIR traces, and we can, we can track these individual bands, these individual spectra as a function of, of time. All right? So we get a continuous plot of the evolution of these gases, and we can kind of see then where they correlate to the mass loss in the TGA. So here's evolution of CO, for example, right? In this, this big step here, we see how that correlates to the evolution of CO. It also has correlation to uh, uh, evolution of water, okay? But we also see in that first mass loss step, hey, there's some water, right? There's no CO coming off. That's, so we can kind of take a good guess that that's the moisture, the water that's trapped or bound inside the straw, okay? And then we see methane. So as we take this further into uh, the decomposition, we see production of methane here at around 500 uh, or so degrees, right? And at that uh, uh, final step that's going on, all right? So that's, that you can, you can maybe, if you haven't thought about evolved gas analysis, you can really see some of the horsepower uh, that, that comes into play. All right. So in summary, we'll go through the key points here. Uh, thermogravimetry or thermogravimetric analysis, TG or TGA, whatever you call it, it's okay. Uh, it's the same thing. We're looking at mass changes in a material with regard to temperature and time. Okay. Remember, you can run a measurement isothermally or dynamically and look at the mass change. You can look at mass gain or mass loss. With TGA, the thermal stability of a material can be determined under different defined atmospheres. Remember we showed some applications with how these samples behave with different gas atmospheres. I'm, I wanna reiterate this point. The vacuum tight design improves the capability to define the atmosphere in the sample chamber and to better control the reactions, the reaction conditions. So remember that example I showed you of the polyethylene liner with the carbon black. If you have any oxygen leaking in from the outside, if you're using a so-called, let's say, gas-tight system, there's a good chance that oxygen is going to be still hiding in there somewhere. All the Netsch instruments are supplied with a vacuum pump, and they're vacuum-tight so that we can pull down that chamber and then backfill with very pure gas atmospheres to control the reaction conditions. Hey, you can even run in a vacuum. I mean, we've got some folks who, who do experiments to, to look at mass behavior in a vacuum itself, okay? So 
the vacuum tight has a huge advantage in terms of controlling the gas atmospheres and uh, uh, and also then uh, I'm going to I'll skip down to this one. It helps for identification of sample off gases uh, makes it much uh, more effective when you're coupled in the TGA or the SDA to things like FTIR uh, mass spectrometers or to GC mass spec uh, because you don't have to worry then about gases bleeding in from the outside uh, background gases that affect your results. And then a final point here was this calculated DTA feature gave us caloric information, exothermal and endothermal effects uh, in, a, in a manner similar to DTA and DSC. And we can use that uh, to, to identify melting points of materials, for example, that might have similar decomposition temperatures, and then also for very accurate temperature calibration. Okay, very accurate temperature calibration. So that's neat. All right, so that's kind of a summary. Before we get into question answers, I just want to uh, uh, make a note here. There is a very, very important webinar coming up on April 5th, 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time called Unleashing the Power of Thermogravimetric Analysis, so that's TGA or SDA, by coupling to FDIR, mass spec, and GC mass spec to characterize the evolved gases. And that's going to be hosted by the American Chemical Society, ACS, and c &E News. And it's going to be conducted by our own uh, head of our laboratory in Germany, Dr. Jan Hans. So if you're interested in evolved gas analysis, I really, really urge you to log into that webinar. You can you can follow this link to register because this is this is held uh, under the domain of uh, ACS. Or if you you uh, don't feel like writing all that down uh, or, or trying to copy it, uh, just go to Google search and type in C and E News. See this here, C and E News. And the name Netch, got to spell Netch right, N-E-T-Z-S-C-H, N-E-T-Z-S-C-H. Do a Google search on CNE News and Netch, and the link will pop right up to web register for that webinar. So don't miss it. It's coming up pretty fast, and there's going to be some great information there about coupling. Uh, more webinar topics, you can either write these down, or you can always just go to our website, uh, Netch.com or Netch-Thermal-Analysis.com, more specifically for our division, netch dash thermal-analysis.com and you can also just type in the word webinar and these links should uh, pop up for you okay uh, finally this is new and this is really neat the Netch Academy website if you want to find that and you're just not sure how to find it real quick way just type in Netch Academy on a Google search bang you'll go right there uh, or here's the uh, here's the direct link uh, or you can just go to our website uh, netch.com or netch thermal analysis.com and type in academy or, or you should see the link for the academy right there okay and what's neat about the academy it's an e-learning center uh, there's going to be a variety of application literature that you can download all the webcasts probably this webinar will be on there in a short period of time for you to download again if you want to watch it again uh, training videos uh, free apps are downloadable off the learning center as well as more tips and tricks so that thing is live I mean it's real time we're adding to that every day uh, and it's it's also points out other available training courses and, and important events in the field of thermal analysis. So so go to the Netch Academy, log in, become a member, and you you got lots of good stuff you can download. And then our training courses can always be found here as well. Uh, we've got uh, uh, user training classes, uh, seminars, and so on. So uh, just go onto the site and take a look at the events, and I'm sure you'll find something interesting for you. So. In terms of contact on this last slide, you see my name, uh, bob.fiddler at netch.com. You can always send me an email, and if I don't know the answer to your question, I will forward it to the right party and get you in contact. That's one of the best things about Netch is that it's, it's really a flat organization. There's no bureaucracy. You can get to know some of the best thermal analysis scientists in the world by name very quickly and become friends. Uh, so, so. That's, I think that's just a hallmark of Netch, so please take advantage of that. If you, if you need something, send me a message. I'll get you to the right guy, and you'll just know some of the best people in the world, person-to-person uh, -person in thermal analysis. Uh, if you forget my email address, you can also look me up on LinkedIn. Just type my name, Bob Fiddler, and I should pop up. I don't think there's too many of us in the world, uh, and, and you, sh you can link to me pretty quick. Okay? So if you can't stick around for question and answer, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your attention. It's uh, on behalf of the company Natch and myself. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, serve you today with this webinar. 
And uh, uh, so I'd just like to say thanks. And I hope that I can uh, cross paths with you at maybe an upcoming meeting somewhere. So uh, it'd be great if you come up and say, hey, I saw your webinar and uh, learned something from it. It'll make me feel good and make me feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing my job. So let's take a few minutes now to look at some questions. And again, if you have to go, thanks for being here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let me minimize this. Okay. I can see this here. Okay. I had a question that I can see here. It says, how large of a sample can be run in my TGA? All right. And that's important. Uh, generally, with our standard TGAs, you can run sample masses up to two grams. And what's really important, and this is a big differentiator uh, to a lot of other instruments, is, is you, you have the full dynamic weighing range. Uh, in, in, in pretty much all of our instruments. So uh, you've got the high, that very high sensitivity across the full range of samples. So if it's two grams and you've got a full dynamic range of two grams, uh, that's, that's really terrific. If you've got, uh, for example, our, our STAs, the STA F1, that's our highest performance thermal balance. It's got a 25 nanogram. I know that's, that's uh, amazing. It's the, the highest resolution thermal balance in the world, 25 nanograms, okay? You can run a sample up to five grams with a dynamic range of the full five grams. And so that's just tremendous. And then you could sit for such long periods of time. The isothermal drift is, 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 is uh, uh, just a, a few micrograms, a couple of micrograms per hour. So it's just phenomenal in terms of looking at long-term stability of materials, either, either very small mass losses or huge mass losses at, at a high degree of accuracy. If you, if you look at the STA models, F three and f5 you can run in the tga mode samples up to 35 grams with a full dynamic range of 35 grams uh, uh, with a 0.1 microgram resolution so there's nothing like that absolutely nothing like that in the world now why uh, would i want that and again that's going to be if you have samples for example it's just a large chunk of material or it's inhomogeneous then you want to run large samples. But remember, we talked a lot during the webinar today about heat transfer. So there's, there's going to be trade-offs in terms of large sample size versus smaller. So you kind of want to balance that if you can. You want to work with as small a sample as you can to get the best heat transfer, uh, uh, but sometimes it's just not possible. I've got a customer, for example, that runs uh, in his STA, they do brick uh, research, and they look at a cubic centimeter of brick it's kind of their standard product. It looks like a, like a red sugar cube. And they look at the evolution of hydrofluoric acid. And uh, in the brick production process, everybody wants to control evolution of HF because that creates acid rain. Okay. So they use the STA then connected to an FTIR to look at these low amounts of hydrofluoric acid. All right. Okay. Let's see. Here's... Here's a question about vacuum tight. Uh, the customer says, I have a system that has a small mass gain, seems to have a small mass gain at the end. What's, what may be going on? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a bet. I'm going to make a bet that you've got a hang down wire type TGA, right? And it's not vacuum tight. It might be gas tight, but I'm going to make a bet that you've got oxygen that's leaking into the system. At, uh, at some point during the process, and your sample is uptaking oxygen. I've seen this once before. There was a catheter company uh, in, in Indiana, and they had a hang down wire TGA, and they, they, they just got used to having this mass gain uh, at the end of their this, this uh, catheter, the polymer that's used in the catheter, they'd get a mass gain. And uh, when I ran those measurements for them on the vacuum tight system, the mass gain was gone. And I said, well, now you, now you know, right? You're bleeding in air or oxygen from the outside in your, your old system, and it's given you a uh, false uh, a mass change, a mass gain, okay? Let's see. Now, here's a question about buoyancy. A customer uh, attendee says here, when I start a run, I see a small mass gain. Is that a buoyancy effect? And the answer is yes, that's a buoyancy effect. Generally, you just uh, can subtract it out. Remember I said at the beginning, just run a baseline. 
and uh, uh, subtract that against your uh, sample curve, and that should, uh, should subtract right out, okay? No big deal. Let's see. I have polymers, and I would like to use an STA, uh, but the cooling is slow. And yeah, that's true. Okay, I think I get your question. The uh, usually the bread and butter furnace with the SDAs is a silicon carbide furnace that heats from room temperature to 1600 degrees C. But it's a pretty big mass furnace, so it's uh, uh, slow on cooling. So what I would recommend uh, if you're doing polymers work, we offer a steel furnace now that's liquid nitrogen cooled, and that'll uh, you can start as low as minus 150 degrees C up to 1,000 degrees C. So that thing is, is really perfect for doing polymers type work. Okay, so if you want all the benefits of an STA, the simultaneous DSC and TGA, but you want to uh, uh, have that uh, ability to do uh, uh, faster cooling or to, to have a broader uh, temperature range uh, down in the liquid nitrogen range, uh, and also, yeah, get that sample uh, cooled fast, uh, maybe even do some controlled cooling studies, then yeah, I would recommend the STAs with one of the steel furnaces. Okay the steel furnace. There's also a silver furnace, uh, but I usually go with the steel nowadays because you've got a broader temperature range than we have with the silver furnace. Okay. Question is, uh, can we get a copy of the presentation? And the answer is yes. Uh, you should be getting something automatically uh, as a PDF. If you don't, just contact me uh, uh, and let me know and I can make sure that you get a copy. So remember, you can send me an email or, or look me up on LinkedIn and I'll take care of you. Oh, here's, oh, here's a good question. Really good. What type of gas coupling do you recommend? Okay. Uh, and I, I get it. Uh, and this is going to depend on your application. This is, this is huge. I, again, I recommend that you, you, uh, refer to that webinar that's coming up, uh, 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 with Dr. Hans that I mentioned, I think it's, it was, it was it April 5th off top, off the top of my head, uh, on coupling. Okay. FTIR. I like FTIR, especially for polymers work, organic materials work, uh, because your molecules stay intact. Interpretation is really easy. You've got built-in uh, spectral searches, uh, database searches with your spectrometer. Uh, so that's nice. But, okay, but FTIR does not uh, work for these symmetrical molecules, things like O2, N2, H2. It's even kind of a little bit finicky when it comes to water. OK, so uh, that's where the mass spectrometer is really useful because the mass spectrometer can pick up those gases quite nicely. All right. Uh, but the downside to the mass spectrometer is that you fragment these molecules. So interpretation is a little bit more complicated, a little more complex. So there's trade offs. OK, whether you're looking at uh, FDIR or mass spec depends on what you need to see. Uh, and uh, but in terms of interpretation, the, the built in databases do a good job of that nowadays as well in the mass spectrometer. Uh, so uh, the, and the mass spectrometer usually is more sensitive. You're down in the PPM range, uh, maybe even lower uh, with a mass spec. So I kind of like it, but you have to know a little bit more, I think, about your interpretation of your spectra than FTIR. All right. Uh, so remember, it has to do with the, the FTIR is limited. It can't, it can't do those symmetrical molecules. There's no dipole moment, so you don't get an infrared active signature. Okay. Uh, but the GC mass spec, now that's pretty neat. Uh, the GC mass spec you can use to capture the gases at specific points uh, in, the, in the weight loss, uh, mass loss profile, and then inject them into the GC. So uh, uh, it gives you a really a better, more real-time characterization of those gases without having any carryover uh, uh, through the TGA process. You can kind of suck up the gas at a specific point and then inject it and analyze it. So that's really useful, the GC mass spec. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I think that's about all the time uh, that I've got. Uh, for those of you who uh, stayed through the whole process, I want to say I, I really appreciate it. It's been excellent to have you for the webinar today. And on behalf, again, of the company, Netch, and myself, I'd just like to say thank you so much for uh, joining us. Hopefully, I got some of your questions answered. And uh, again, if you have more questions, send me an email. I'll get them to the right person if I can't answer them myself. So uh, probably I'll close at this point and uh, just say thank you very much for your attention. And I uh, hope that we can see you and help you with uh, Netch instrumentation down the road. So I wish you uh, um, safe uh, 
safe and happy uh, holiday weekend here, Easter weekend. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Bye-bye now.